Okay. Um, going too many windows. All right. So um, welcome and thank you for coming to PAW in general and uh, this workshop, Don't Panic, Be Proactive. I'm Ruth and I'm one of the organizers of PAW and I'm a learning services coordinator at the Student Learning Commons at Simon Fraser University. Um, I'm presenting through SFU and uh, SFU is on the ancestral and unceded land of the Coast Salish people. Um, and specifically the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Kutsi, and Coquitlam people at the Burnaby campus, and the Kakait, Kwantlen, Semiamu, and Tawasan people at the Surrey campus. Uh, I personally am in my home in New Westminster, and that's uh, the, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Kakait nation. Um, I know that elsewhere in Canada, a lot of um, lands, ancestral lands of First Nations and um, other Indigenous people were subject to treaty in British Columbia, um, hardly any treaties. So that's why we consider the land uh, unceded. It was never given up. So here's an outline. Uh, there's two aspects. One is don't panic. And specifically, we're referring to last minute panics um, when you leave the work till the end and you complete everything in a big flurry. So we'll learn about a couple of cycles that really feed the last minute panics. And then we can have a bit of a discussion about the effects. Um, and I think the longer and more important part of the presentation is about what you can do to be proactive in avoiding last minute panics. So uh, the very, <laughs> all of these points sound really basic, but when you actually put them into practice, it's not quite as easy. So just, you know, getting started, having some strategies to get started, um, breaking the two cycles that I'll be telling you about, uh, breaking tasks down into small pieces and spreading these small pieces out over time, and welcome Emma. Welcome, Emma. And uh, and going to seek help. So we're going to look at um, what fuels last minute panics, how they affect you, and and I'd love to hear a little bit from the four of you, either um, unmuting yourself or in the chat, about these two questions. And also um, at any point in the presentation, if you have a question or a comment, feel free to pop it into chat or to unmute yourself as you wish. <laughs> okay, so I'm seeing something in chat and then I have to actually be able to open the chat. Okay. Um, yeah. So stress from last minute panics. Um, Jasmine says feeling overwhelmed, wanting to do well and spending time on assignments, but not having so much to do in a, sh but I mean, but having so much to do in a short time. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot there, you know, I mean, especially if you want to do well, um, it can be really overwhelming when there's a lot to do. And um, sometimes maybe you underestimate how much time it's going to take and you know and then you're starting to think oh maybe i can't perform to my standards in the time that's left and it really can lead to a panic so it's kind of like stress will fuel last minute panics and stress will also be an effective last minute panics <sighs> So I guess building on um, what Jasmine was talking about, uh, this is a well-known cycle that a lot of people get into in procrastination. And the first thing I wanna say is that um, there's a bit of a myth that procrastination stems from being lazy or it stems from having poor time management skills. And that's generally not the case. Um, sometimes time management strategies like scheduling and writing can help, but, Primarily, uh, procrastination is an issue of emotional regulation. 
So when Jasmine says that it's fueled by um, becoming overwhelmed, that that is is really quite typical. It's negative emotions like overwhelm and anxiety that really fuel it. So um, you know, and, and managing it often has to deal with being able to deal with those emotions in a more productive way than just putting things off. So the first thing that tends to happen is you become aware of something you need to do. In my case, it's uh, working on things like taxes and finance. That's typically what I procrastinate. Um, but in most students' cases, it might be something like I should study for an exam. Um, and then it has to do with how you assess that task. The next step, like, do you feel good or do you feel bad when you think about I should study for the exam? Do you, um, you know, do you think, oh, okay, that's doable? Uh, if you think it's doable, probably you'll do it. But quite often you get overwhelmed. You feel like, oh, there's too much. This course is too difficult. This is going to be really boring. It's going to take forever. Um, I'm going to fail no matter what I do, <laughs> you know, so it, it's thoughts like this, where you assess the task as being kind of beyond your capacity, beyond your control, maybe, um, that really fuels the procrastination cycle. And it can create um, a lot of distress. So emotional distress, the sense of overwhelm, stress that people are talking about. Um, sometimes, you know, maybe you're not even so conscious of those emotions, but you might feel it in your body. You might feel like your heart beating fast or you start getting a headache or getting really tired, um, or, um, you feel a tightness in your chest, that kind of thing when you are, um, starting to feel distressed because of your task appraisal. And then there's another, you know, kind of cognitive piece where you're making excuses. You're kind of giving yourself an invitation or a permission to procrastinate. So, you know, say you're feeling tired and headachey, you might say, I'll feel better once I nap, I can study later. And sleep and napping is quite often a go-to procrastination activity for people. Um, another one, you know, might just be like, oh, you know, I'm just gonna, check my email a bit before I start studying for the exam. And, you know, when, when you think it's going to be a five minute, minute email check, you know, then you switch to socials and it, it sucks you in possibly for hours. Um, so you're giving yourself permission to do the avoidance behavior, then you engage in the avoidance behavior. And while you're um, engaging in the avoidance behavior, you know, especially if you're asleep, I guess you're, you know, you're feeling relief, you're feeling relaxed. Um, you're not so worried about the exam that you need to prepare for the distressing thoughts or distressing feelings might kind of go away for a bit. Um, but then at some point you become aware of it again. And when you become aware of it again, it can get worse because, you know, now, you know, maybe it's the next day or maybe it's um, late at night and you're exhausted. So the cycle not only tends to repeat, but it tends to get worse and worse and worse as it cycles. And so then when you finally do do the work, it's, it's like, whoa, this is even more overwhelming and you can be more panicky and desperate feeling. Welcome Pramit and Leah. Um, okay, so this is another cycle and um, how many people have seen this diagram or this way of thinking about time management before? Anybody seen this? Oh, Denise has. Yeah, it's a very, um, like it's a very kind of common framework for looking at it. And it was, uh, it predates Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, but it was popularized in that. Um, so the idea behind this is that any activity can be categorized in one of these four quadrants based on how important it is. And then the other dimension is how urgent it is. You know, does it have to be done immediately? Um, so tasks in quadrant one are both important and urgent. So, you know, they are like, you know, when you're cramming for a test and 
it's the next day kind of thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a last minute panic. It might just be that, you know, every morning when I wake up, I need to go to work. You know, that's an important and urgent activity, not particularly panicky. Um, quadrant two are activities that are important, but not urgent. That's when you're working on something long term. So, you know, like a graduate student might be working on their dissertation, um, you know, like years in advance of when it's due. Um, you might be working on a paper that's due a couple of months from now for your course. Um, you know, even activities like exercise, um, you've got long-term health benefits, but it doesn't necessarily have to be done today. Um, so those are tasks uh, often that people will put off. Like they know that there's, you know, it's, it's important, it's good for you, but there's no urgency behind it. Um, then there's quadrant three activities, and that one is called the quadrant of illusion. Um, so sometimes, I mean, it's, it's activities that are urgent, but not necessarily important. So sometimes it's, you know, feeling like you need to answer a text as soon as it comes in. Um, it feels urgent, not necessarily, but it really kind of isn't, but it feels that way. So that's one illusion. But also when um, maybe somebody else has something that's very important to them and they create some urgency around it. Um, and then sometimes it's hard to say no and you take that on. So that's kind of an illusion. You know, this, this task is important and urgent for um, somebody in your life, but it might not be important and urgent to you. But it has that illusion, especially if you have trouble setting boundaries and often you get sucked into spending time in quadrant three. So an example could be, you know, that your priority maybe is to prepare for an exam. Um, but then a friend calls and says that they have, you know, a bit of an emergency and they need some help. Uh, a lot of people will get sucked into that and that's where they'll spend their time. Um, or your boss calls and says, you know, somebody called in sick, you know, please come and cover the shift. Um, or you're a teaching assistant and you're working on your own dissertation, but you have like a whole bunch of emails from students about an assignment that is due coming up for them. Um, you know, and, and if any of you are teaching assistants, and I have been, um, it's really good to set boundaries around, you know, how often you're going to be checking your emails, like right at the beginning of the term, you know, I will check my emails for an hour between nine and 10 every morning. And then if you miss that, it will be the next day. Quadrant four has to do with, you know, those are the typical procrastination activities. And in a certain amount of them, you know, that's, that's fine. It's, it's a question of degree. So these are activities that are both unimportant and not urgent, like watching Netflix, playing computer games. I think um, I see that there's a comment that came into chat. Um, but I used to think that urgent and important had the same meaning. How is urgent being used here? Okay, so importance, I mean, well, importance is kind of self-explanatory. Urgent is being used um, as to whether it's time sensitive or not. So, you know, an exam that is the next day is urgent, whereas an exam that is um, a week from now is not as urgent. Um, okay, so good question. The other thing is, although I'm saying that every activity can be classified in one of these, um, sometimes it's subjective and it's uh, situation dependent as to which quadrant an activity will fall into. So, um, for example, socializing. Um, for some people, you know, hanging out with their friends is something that they do when they're procrastinating, and it would be in quadrant four. Um, you know, and that's especially if, if people do it excessively, if like every single day they're seeing their friends for hours and hours. Um, but a certain amount of socializing is really needed um, for people to maintain good mental health. I think we all discovered that during the pandemic. Well, I mean, we are still in the pandemic, but, you know, during the more isolating periods of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, for some people in some situations, you know, especially after you've been isolating quite a bit in your own place, 
um, socializing is a quadrant two activity. You know, it's you know a certain amount of it is essential for your long term health. So the point of this quadrant system is not to be judgy of every time you know you do something pleasurable. It is you know just sort of a framework for thinking about things. Um, so what is the cycle of urgency? Like the, the quadrant system itself isn't the cycle of urgency. Um, it's how a lot of students and a lot of people in general operate. Um, it's like not really spending a lot of time on quadrant two tasks, you know, putting off important tasks that aren't urgent and really focusing on tasks that are urgent, you know, just being very deadline driven. And, uh, you know, at times I'm like that at work, it's like I have no time to think about anything that isn't later that day or the next day. Um, you know, and, and you're just kind of always operating in a state of, you know, I've got to do this right now. If not, I'm going to be hooped, um, you know, and, and, and that kind of gets you going. And a lot of people will say I work best under pressure. And then that's an excuse or a rationalization for working in quadrant one quite a bit. Um, and then what happens when you work a lot in quadrant one, uh, you can get exhausted, you can get burnt out. Um, you know, a lot of people physically and mentally like will hit a wall at a certain point, And then all they can do is go to quadrant four, you know, which is, you know, excessive sleeping and watching Netflix and just, you know, really zoning out sometimes for days on end. Um, and then when they're in quadrant four, um, things become urgent again. Uh, and, and, you know, and even when they were working quadrant one, they weren't working quadrant two, then when they're in quadrant four, and they're just burnt out, they're not working on quadrant two. So everything that was in quadrant two before goes into quadrant one. And it perpetuates the cycle of only working on those really um, deadline driven tasks. Uh, and it's, it can be really hard to get out of because then everything just starts to pile up in quadrant one. Um, so maybe use the reactions, like see if people relate to that. Um, yeah, it keeps jumping from quadrant one to four over and over again. And then, you know, and maybe some quadrant three involved where you're pulled into other people's urgency and you never really do get to those quadrant two things that you want to work on in advance. Um, yeah, I was just thinking maybe people could use the reaction buttons and, you know, see to what extent you relate to it. And if you don't relate to it, you could put that in chat, maybe. You know, because it's not necessarily universal that everybody does this. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Brittany says 100%. Okay, that's a really strong reaction button. Awesome. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how to get out of that cycle. So <clears throat> maybe put into chat or unmute yourself because I'd like to hear about uh, what effects that people feel when they've done that, you know, when they're just working last minute on a bunch of things and possibly feeling panic. I mean, the feeling of panic is in itself um, an adverse reaction, obviously. And I'm just gonna close my door so that I don't get background noise. Oh yeah, so Denise is saying not high quality work. Yeah, because if you haven't left yourself enough time, then you have to cut corners somewhere. And a lot of the time it's uh, on the quality for sure. Mm. And when you're in a state of panic, like what else is going on? Oh yeah, my heart just races trying to finish everything. Yeah, like you can start getting physical symptoms for sure, you know, and... Um, I think really in the extreme are people that spend their lives working in the last minute and pulling all nighters and adopting all sorts of healthy and unhealthy habits to keep that going. Um, and I think, yeah, and I it, like, yeah, Denise is saying getting sick. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, sick. Um, migraine, anxiety, depression, Pramit is saying, absolutely. Remembering your previous failures, life feels miserable. Yeah. And, you know, and if, if you're, you know, trying to study for an exam last minute, 
and um, you're kind of miserable and you're remembering your past failures, you know, that's brain power that you're not devoting to the task at hand. So, you know, your focus is sacrificed as well. Um, and I was just going to say that, you know, maybe, you know, even if in the moment you're not feeling anxious or depressed or sick, um, if you do this for your life, it can accumulate and, you know, be more prone to heart disease and things of that nature. Um, yeah, only one day more. <laughs> All these thought patterns, I think everything is, you know, really relatable. Um, yeah, and I think really the, the extreme effect um, is that it can make cheating, you know, a lot more likely too, because um, cheating seems to be fueled a lot of the time by desperation, you know, by like having a high standard and having conditions where, you know, you, you've lost your confidence that you can meet that high standard that you have. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, a lot of the time last minute panic is behind some of the academic integrity issues that we see in university or college as well. So it is important to break the cycle from so many standpoints. And this is the simplest, most basic, maybe most frustrating advice, but I'll get I'll get into like a little bit more detail. Um, so maybe from your reactions, how many of you tend to find that getting started is the hardest part and that once you're started, you can pretty much keep going most of the time. Yeah, Denise is saying yes. Okay. Yeah, so maybe Denise is the only one, but I'm sure it's, yeah, like Pramita is saying it's it's hard for me to start. You know, so may, like maybe that's not the only problem, but, um, but it can be really hard to get started for sure. Uh, so later I'm going to talk about breaking large tasks down so that they're more manageable. But what I'm going to suggest now is breaking the time down a little bit. Um, so, you know, we really recommend that when you're planning your studying, that you um, only plan, you know, fairly short study blocks, you know, like kind of an hour or so frequently throughout the week, rather than saying, okay, I'm going to do all day Saturday and all day Sunday, because that can really fuel procrastination and lack of focus. Um, but sometimes even an hour, like seeing an hour looming ahead of you to work on some really disgusting task is not going to be short enough. So I say, you know, just get it down as small as you need it to be. You know, do you think you can manage a half hour of it? In that case, go for a half hour. Do you think you can manage 15 minutes? Even if you think you can manage five minutes. I mean, I don't think, I don't think anybody really would, would um, say that, you know, five minutes is just way too overwhelming. Um, if five minutes is the most you can do, then commit to five minutes before you do your procrastination activity. Okay, I'm exhausted. I want to take a nap. Well, I'm going to work for five minutes and then I'm going to see if I really need a nap. Um, so five minutes is often enough to even just get you into it, to make it seem doable, to, you know, even maybe say, okay, I've read I've read, you know, most of one page, I want to finish the page. <laughs> oh, I want to like finish this section of the reading. So, you know, it, you know, quite often just inertia or like the will to try to complete something takes over. Um, if after five minutes, you know, you really do want to just disengage, give yourself a time limit for how long you will do the procrastination activity um, and set a timer. And when the timer goes off, you know, again, challenge yourself to come back to the activity even for five minutes, you know, and eventually you should be able to get into it. Um, or maybe you can string a bunch of five minutes together to at least do something. Breaking the cycle of procrastination. Um, these are all a bunch of dysfunctional steps, but the good news about them is that at any of these steps, you can do something to intervene, to break the cycle. So, um, you know, looking at the different steps, can anybody suggest um, one way that they could intervene at one of the steps? 
Yeah, change my location so you can't nap. So that that is um, breaking the cycle at the avoidance stage, you know, where like if that's your go-to activity, if you know that you're somewhere where you can't nap, then you <laughs> you won't, you know, you'll just kind of keep working. And I think a lot of people find that changing their location uh, will help, you know, especially if they have electronic distractions at home or, you know, that kind of thing or social distractions. Absolutely, that's, that's important. The uh, location can be. Anybody else at a different stage? Uh, not be tempted to eat free food from home. Yeah, yeah. So like taking snack breaks when you are procrastinating for sure. Um, that's another behavioral kind of intervention. Mm, what about, you know, at the appraisal of task resources and outcome stage, at the appraisal stage, if you're thinking, you know, like I'm gonna fail, there's too much, this is really boring, I don't have time, you know, that kind of thing. Is there anything you can do there? Break down the task, yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about that more extensively later. Um, and I do think, you know, if you have a large task, like you have a research paper, one of the worst things you can do that fuels the appraisal is when you when you sit down and you say, OK, I've got to work on my 20 page research paper that can be incredibly overwhelming. And it can be a lot uh, better if you say something like I'm going to spend the next half hour just to make an outline or something like that. Yeah, start with an easier part. Yeah, um, that's that's a good idea too. Um, now there's all these all this you know software for your reference list, so you don't have to do it manually. But when I was a student, I would always start with my reference list, you know, and just do it manually because that would get me into the task. Um, yeah, the gravity of the negative feelings. So sometimes you can challenge the feelings as well, right? I mean, or challenge the thoughts that you have. Um, so I always used to think I was going to fail or that, you know, I was going to get like a really bad mark, much lower than what I would normally get kind of thing. And um, I, I would work myself up to do the studying by say, you know, like, wait a minute, every time you have an exam coming up, you think you're going to fail or you think you're going to get like below a C or something. Have you ever gotten a grade that low on an exam at university? No, you haven't. You know, so you're kind of talking to yourself like this appraisal stage. You're um, you're it's like you're talking to yourself and you're telling yourself a really bad story. So, you know, you need to sort of change the story that you tell yourself and it's you know and it doesn't mean just sort of i'm good enough i'm smart enough and gosh darn it people like me you know you want to make it something believable um you know so you, you could say well i mean if i you know if i put in a few hours today then at least i have a shot at a b you know or something that might be a bit more of a doable thought that you'd believe than saying oh i'm gonna get an a plus all i need to do is study you might not really believe that so I see some other comments. Uh, I need to get some sleep. Like there's no other way I can feel better except my whole system shuts down for some time. Yeah, so that's like a typical procrastination behavior, I guess. Um, a friend told me yesterday, a finished proposal is a good proposal. And now I try to tell this to myself every morning that yeah, totally. Um, it sounds like maybe uh, your, your procrastination, I, I went like last week, I think it was, I went to this huge workshop about uh, procrastination was two and a half hours long and uh, the guy went into a whole bunch of um, factors that kind of fuel procrastination they're different for different people and one of them is perfectionism and yeah so if if like what is leading you to procrastinate is you're thinking it's I've got to make it perfect I've just got to polish it up a little more oh it's so overwhelming because I'm trying to get an A plus um yeah, I mean, it's it's really good to think, okay, like the first thing is it has to be finished. It has to be submitted. Um, and, you know, and if I have extra time after that, I can, I can do that. Um, and, you know, it's good to think of things like the 80-20 principle, which is that 
Um, 80% of the result often takes 20% of the time. So if you're trying to get the other 20% of the result, you might spend you know, four times as much time to get it. Um, you know, so just like telling yourself all sorts of messages like that. Um, at the distress stage, you know, then you can do things that, um, like instead of doing the procrastination behavior, you can do sort of healthier activities that are more likely to re re relieve your stress. So if you feel like you need to nap, maybe instead of napping, um, you know, do some deep breathing or some meditation for a few minutes. There's um, a lot of meditation apps. Maybe you need to just like take a brisk walk in the cold air outside uh, for, you know, I mean, we're not talking a super long walk. We're talking maybe a 10 minute walk. Maybe you even want to do some aerobic exercises for five, 10 minutes to, um, you know, get some of the um, anxious energy out of your body, you know, just sort of activities like that. So even if you say, I'm going to just spend 10 minutes checking my Facebook or my Instagram or something, like that's not the same as saying I'm going to spend 10 minutes like running around the block because, you know, one will probably just be 10 minutes and probably will have a stress relieving effect on your body. Um, whereas the other one is not going to have any sort of stress relieving effect on your body. And it's just going to um, probably draw you in for longer. So you get the idea, you can, you, you can intervene at any time. At the excuse stage, that's where you might say, um, okay, well, I'm just gonna do it for five minutes. You know, the previous get started strategy, you know, I'll, yeah, I know I'll feel better once I nap, I'm just gonna do this for five minutes and then I will nap. And then, you know, we'll see, maybe you won't nap. <laughs> All right, so then the cycle of urgency, just going between quadrant one, doing all the work in a rush, then being burnt out and having to do, you know, just kind of nothing for a while in quadrant four. How do you get to quadrant two? Does anyone have some suggestions about that? planning in advance, have it scheduled. I think, yeah, that is, that is definitely part of it. But that, I mean, that can be hard though. If, um, you know, say you have something that's due in two weeks, but you have, you know, the whole two weeks is, is filled up with like a bunch of more urgent deadlines. Yeah, artificial deadlines, definitely, definitely um, a good strategy. You know, so if something is due in two weeks, you can say, okay, I wanna finish it in one week. You know, so my deadline is one week from now. Um, that can, you know, especially if you're saying I work best under pressure, artificial deadlines can really be powerful, especially if you do something to make yourself accountable to that deadline, like telling a friend that, you know, my, you know, you tell your friend that the thing is due a week earlier than usual and get them to check in on you or something. Um, that's a good one too. But what if, you know, you, you, you really like the whole next week is filled up with like a ton of urgent things, you know, and you're like, how can I, I don't even know if I'm going to have time for my quadrant one things. How can I make time for my quadrant two things? So I'm thinking that even if you can, you know, the whole short piece of time thing is powerful here. So if you are, I mean, like if, if you're not in the throes of quadrant one, then these strategies that are being suggested are really, really good. You know, just sort of like scheduling your quad work on quadrant two, maybe building in some accountability and rewards to, um, to follow it. But you know, but Pramit is saying, yeah, I need to finish the quadrant one activities first because it's urgent. Uh, so if you're in the throes of quadrant one, you know, then it, it's hard to break the cycle because if you never do get to the quadrant two things, they become quadrant one things. Um, so what I would suggest is just even scheduling in, you know, and holding yourself to somehow like through accountability or something or alarms to 15 minutes a day, you know, or I mean, maybe you're not so into quadrant one, it can be a half hour a day, but, you know, just sort of a smallish amount of time per day, 
that you are specifically going to devote to long-term activities. And you might not really see the results right away, but eventually the amount of stuff in quadrant two is going to start going down. And eventually after that, the moderate of the, the, the mound of stuff in quadrant one is going to start going down. Um, and then you can start getting to more of a quadrant two lifestyle where you can schedule things in advance and get to them. Um, you know, but I mean, of course, like if you can only carve out a little bit of time every day, it's going to probably take, you know, like a month or more um, to see any results from it. But eventually you will. Um, and then maybe when the next term starts, for those of you who aren't graduate students and just have constant work, um, when the next term starts, maybe you start by doing these quadrant two strategies right away so it doesn't quite get like that. So uh, breaking tasks down has come up a few times. We'll spend a bit more time on that one. Um, I, you know, we've always suggested to start with like even 15 minutes when you first receive um, a project guidelines, as long as you have enough information that you can start. Sometimes you don't quite get enough information for that. But as soon as you get enough information to work on something, start working on it. Um, and, you know, certainly if you have a lot of quadrant one things and then you get assigned something that's not due for two months, um, it might be kind of rational to think, you know, I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't have time to do that. This is not urgent in the least. Um, but the thing is that the longer you put away something, the more the anxiety builds up around it. So when you first receive a project, um, it probably feels pretty doable. Um, so you want to kind of take advantage of that energy for a bit, you know, so like start looking at it, realize how doable it is, plan it out a little bit, you know, maybe choose a topic if, if it's something where you have to choose a topic. Um, and that can go a long way, you know, even if you then put it away for a bit, that can go a long way towards um, not having the anxiety and overwhelm build up to too much around that project. Um, the other thing that can happen is you look at it and you feel like right away, this is completely overwhelming. I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this even for two months from now. You know, I don't have the skills. This is calling for, you know, for something I learned in a previous class that I didn't learn very well, or, you know, like you might right away recognize that this is really scary and then start to panic from day one. Um, you don't want to do that, you know, so the strategy then is to seek some help. And I know a lot of people um, really hesitate to go to their professors or teaching assistants or even a classmate to seek help on something, but um, it's the thing to do, you know, <laughs> because otherwise you might just go into procrastination and avoidance. So talking to, you know, like even a classmate or a teaching assistant or something, um, it has the benefit of getting the academic information that you need, but it also, um, you know, kind of intervenes where the avoidance starts kicking in. Um, so that's a really useful thing to do. And, you know, and, and sometimes I get my students to experiment with seeking help like that, you know, and just sort of um, journal on uh, like how it worked for them and that kind of thing. And, you know, and usually the most hesitant students to seek help, um, once they have a good experience with it, that it, it just really breaks that resistance right away. Um, so I would really suggest that. And if it's like a, you know, a one month project or something like that, and it's just completely beyond you and you seek help really early on, um, you know, it might be what you need, or maybe it doesn't quite give you what you need. And, but, you know, hey, it's like a month. You still have many more times that you can keep seeking help. You could like go back, do a little bit of work on it, get stuck again, seek help again, you know, and you can keep doing that until it's doable for you. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, the thing is to break the project into a bunch of small steps. How small a step? Probably each step should take uh, no more than a few hours. So if it's something like a dissertation, 
um, you know, that's a lot of breaking things into steps. And there, uh, I know some universities have dissertation cal calculators on their websites that will take you through like a two, three year project. Um, work gradually and consistently in quadrant two, you know, so just keep moving forward, even it's a, a small step. I've heard uh, people suggest to have some easy steps, like, you know, I think Jasmine was saying start on an easy step. Um, but you know, especially if it's a if it's a really big project, there are probably some much easier steps that you can reserve for days when you're feeling like low energy, sick, depressed, you know, so that you always have something that you can do and you never really stop working on it and get stuck. So I'm going to have you do an activity now. Um, as an example of it, just pull out a piece of paper or, um, you know, a document in your word processor or something like that. And write down um, one high priority task that you've been procrastinating, whether it's schoolwork or it's not schoolwork. For me, it would definitely be some sort of financial management task. So when you all have that, we get to the next step. So you may be starting at the beginning of the task or not, but um, you want to be breaking it down into tasks that you can do in a relatively small amount of time. Um, if it's a large task, it can take a really long time to break it down fully. So I'm not saying at this point, break it down fully. Sometimes people use like detailed breaking down tasks as a way of procrastinating. So don't break it down fully. Um, sorry about that. Just identify, you know, somewhere between one and three steps. And I'll give you a minute to write down between one and three steps. And these should be next steps, like not, you know, a step that you would be doing much later. So my first step is this. After that's done, then I'll do this. And you can leave it at that at this point. Once you have a first step, take another look at it because it might not really be your first step. Um, sometimes you are kind of, um, you have some implicit steps or you have steps that you're trying to avoid uh, and ignore because that's what is creating the anxiety. So, you know, go back and think, is this, really my first step or is there something else I have to do, especially something I'm trying to avoid? Uh, so a good example of that is the help seeking step as well. You know, maybe um, you've written down, uh, my first step is to do the first two problems of my assignment, if it's like a quantitative assignment, um, but you really are lacking the skills to do it. So maybe your real first step is you have to go and talk to a teaching assistant. Um, and you hate talking to teaching assistants. It's a big barrier for you. But, you know, that is the real first step. So then you write that down and you set a deadline. So um, the next step to this activity is setting uh, a time or a deadline um, for each of the steps that you've identified and scheduling them in. And if you don't have a, you know, a calendar or an agenda or something like that, just write down when you're going to do it and really commit to it. So, you know, this is why I'm saying write it down because sometimes people just keep everything they need to do in their head. And, you know, that's not the greatest time management strategy, but this isn't really a time management workshop. Um, but, you know, actually writing it down can be more of a commitment. And then you can up the ante even more. Like you can, you know, put your email into, your, into the chat and say, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Check with me on this date, Ruth. You know, and I, and I will if you want. Like that's kind of an extreme example. But um, sometimes accountability really helps. Sometimes even unmuting yourself and just telling the people here, this is my first step. This is when I'm going to do it. Um, you know, and creating a reward for yourself, 
Um, sometimes the reward is contingent on getting the thing done. But um, that big workshop I went to, it was sort of suggested that instead of necessarily making rewards contingent, just if you know you're going into a period where you're going to be working on a lot of things that are hard for you, um, schedule something pleasurable towards the end of the day every day so that you have something to look forward to. I'm looking at my watch. I've spent, and actually the workshop's supposed to be over. It's 50 minutes, but I'm going to keep going. Um, so we've spent five minutes on this. Um, so it, it really doesn't take long to, you know, begin the process of breaking down tasks. Like you, you don't need it fully broken down. You really just need the first couple of steps or even the first one step, as long as then you repeat the process. Um, so we're doing this activity to, to show you that, you know, you can plan things out in a manageable way and it doesn't have to take tons of time. And I think, you know, that's a procrastination excuse people make about planning. And they're like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to um, plan out my steps for this assignment because, you know, that would be a lot of time that I could use towards actually doing it. But then they do neither. So, um, yeah, so sometimes it's worth investing like five, 10 minutes to at least just, you know, think over a few steps and commit to them. Um, so here's a tool, um, and even though it's an SFU tool, anybody can write down the URL or take a, a picture or something and use this. And uh, this is when you don't wanna do the brain work towards breaking a task down yourself. It's called the assignment calculator, and I think other universities have this as well. Some of them, as I said, even have dissertation calculators. And, um, it's for primarily research papers. It can be used for any writing assignment. Um, and and uh, what you do is you enter, you know, whatever date it is, uh, whatever date the thing is due, and you hit calculate and it breaks the task down. Um, I think this is eight steps that it gives you. It might be 10. Um, and it gives you um, an artificial deadline for each step. So as you see, your first step here is by you know, October 16th, which is one day after the start date, you are supposed to understand your assignment, which has to do with like reading the guidelines, you know, maybe asking any questions you need to ask, choosing a topic. Um, and in case you always have real difficulty about how to select a topic, you can go to this hyperlink at the bottom, how to develop a topic for a research paper. So it's just a series of steps towards a research paper. Every step has an artificial deadline. Every step has resources. You know, and I think one of the reasons people procrastinate sometimes is if they feel like, I don't know how to do this, you know, and the resources will help you with that. Um, so I think like that's a really useful um, tool uh, and it can be customized. I mean, I think people, you know, sometimes say, well, I'm not doing a research paper, you know, and it's going to give me a research step so I can't use this. Or I already, you know, started this and I've completed the first five steps so I can't use this. And it's like, of course you can. You just, um, you know, maybe you print it out and you cross things off and you customize it. And you know, so maybe if you've already done a few steps, you cross those off, you adjust the rest of the dates, or you take out the research step and adjust the rest of the dates. Um, or if it's a huge research step, you know, maybe that in itself is overwhelming because it's going to take you a week. So, you know, maybe you want to break that one down finer on your own, but at least this tool will get you started um, on the process of breaking down um, an assignment. Uh, if it's not a written assignment that you need to break down, you can um, even go to this and use it as a model for how to break down a different type of assignment. You know, so um, quantitative assignment, you know, maybe you want to do it by a number of problems a day um, or something. And, <clears throat> but, it, but it also might be processes. It might be that, you know, on the first day, I review two of the concepts needed for this assignment. And I think about which type of problems apply under those concepts. Um, you know, then the next day I review another concept and see how it fits in. And then you start kind of tackling problem to problem. 
Um, so why is it so powerful to work on projects over time? Um, I, I've actually um, convened workshops where it's actually math professors presenting and they are the first to say that sometimes you just need a break when you're doing quantitative work. You know, sometimes you hit a wall, you, you know, take the rest of the day off, you come back to it and all of a sudden you can solve it. Uh, and I find that like when I do, you know, wordles, sudokus, you know, things of that nature, sometimes if I just go away and then I, you know, like if I got interrupted and I come back again, I, I just see something. Um, you know, being able to have your full brain power devoted to it because you're rested and because you don't have half of your brain beating yourself up. That's a big advantage working on something over time. Um, you have more opportunities to seek help and uh, you might get a flash of insight. Um, you know, when, when your brain is relaxed, like when you've been working on something and your brain is relaxed or focused on something else, you know, sometimes it'll just hit you what you need to do. Like um, one time I was working on redeveloping a course and I was like, you know, I, I just was kind of stuck about what the basic organizing principle of the course should be. And um, I was on the SkyTrain one day, like I'd been probably thinking about this, you know, in the back of my mind for months. And I was just, you know, the SkyTrain is like our transit system here in Vancouver. And I was just kind of chilling as I was taking a ride and it came to me like, you know, this is the organizing principle on which I can build the course. And then I was able to organize the whole course. Um, so I'm sure people have had similar experiences, but those experiences don't happen if you don't give yourself time for them. Um, and then here is a template from Open University in London, England. And um, you can you know, take a picture of the URL or something if you want. It's a template for taking notes, um, notes that'll record your critical thinking when you're working on, you know, say reading for an argumentative paper or something like that. And how is this related? <laughs> um, it's related because um, critical thinking takes time. You know, so if you're assigned an argumentative paper where you have to, you know, read a bunch of other sources and see the relationships and see, you know, the strengths and weaknesses and which source do you, you know, prefer over other sources and why, you know, like it, it, that you can't, you can't do that in a couple of days. Um, you could write something, but it's not going to be something with the deep insights that you need to do well on it. Um, so, you know, critical thinking is something that really takes time. Creativity takes time. And the other way to be proactive when you're working on something that requires critical thinking is to take good notes and to take notes, you know, not like the notes that you would take when you are studying for a multiple choice test. You know, it's not just about facts, um, but taking a note about um, what you're thinking, right? So there, there's place for, you know, what do you think the evidence is? What do you think the strengths and weaknesses of that piece are? What questions you have? How do you think that, you know, this connects to other topics or other sources? So for those of you who have, um, tasks coming up where you need to exercise some reading and critical thinking, you know, I really recommend accessing this template. And the template actually is in a whole, it's a big, bigger resource about critical thinking in general, which can be useful. So tests as well, studying over time, so much more effective than cramming. Um, and it's also the process of studying for a big test is something that can be broken down and I'm getting towards the end of my time. So I don't really have uh, time to go into the process of making an exam preparation inventory. Um, but if you take a picture of this slide, there's a YouTube video that's a few minutes long that we've made at the Student Learning Commons at SFU. Um, I, if I remember, I can put it in our document library for PAW. And, um, that will take you through the process of basically breaking down the topics you need to cover, um, identifying any knowledge gaps that you have, like which, which topics are gonna to be more difficult for you because you're missing something, 
um, doing a time estimate uh, of each section, how long is it going to take for you to cover each section, and that's going to be a lot more accurate than doing a time estimate um, of the task as a whole. Um, oh, Praneet wants me to post a link in the chat. Um, I think at the moment I would have trouble copying it right now, but I can, you know, in, in a few minutes I can do that. Um, yeah, and then kind of determining the priority of studying that topic. Um, and then time estimation, uh, when, you're, when you're estimating the amount of time something will take, any academic task, multiply it by one and a half what you originally think to give yourself some buffer time. Um, the other thing you can do for tasks that repeat, like, um, you know, like a particular type of homework assignment or a reading that you have to do every week is keep a record um, of the amount of time it's taking so that in the future you will allocate um, a better, you know, more accurate estimate for it. Yeah, so once you've inventoried and you've broken it down and you, you know, you're going to need an hour for this topic, two hours for that topic, then you can put those blocks into your schedule um, and build some accountability towards doing it. Um, so that's the previous slides are in the period immediately before exams. Um, this slide is illustrating that um, even throughout the term, if you review what you're learning frequently, you know, and, and you know, after you've done some reading or you're, um, you've been to a lecture, reviewing it by trying to remember what you've learned and try to reconstruct it before you consult your notes, and then reviewing on a regular basis thereafter, um, you will retain a lot more than if you just cram at the end. So the bottom of this black curve on day 30, where you um, remember very little of what it is you've learned because you weren't doing review, as opposed to this dashed line where you were doing review, um, that just shows that you know, you know virtually nothing at that point from what you've learned. And although you think you're gonna be cramming at the last minute and you think it's just studying, you're really expecting yourself to kind of relearn the whole course within um, the 10 or so hours that you've allocated for cramming. And that's one reason why, you know, cramming seems to always take longer than what you think. Um, yeah, and then we don't really have a lot of time to talk about help, but we have been talking about it like all throughout, that help is a really good way of breaking the academic and psychological barriers. Um, towards getting going on something. And it's a really proactive thing that you can do. And uh, the Student Learning Commons website from SFU, it's a good resource. It's accessible, you know, really to anybody. Um, and there are a lot of resources under the colored tiles at the top. Um, on the left-hand side where it says find a workshop, if you scroll down to the very bottom, there's a link to a bunch of workshop recordings. And so this recording will be posted there, but there's like other recordings on other topics if you wanna watch them, you know, and they, they don't require an SFU ID or anything like that. Um, and, and if you are an SFU student like Jasmine, um, if you go to this web survey here, you can get co-curricular record credit for attending this. Um, so I'll let you go and I'm sorry you have overstayed. I hope I haven't made you late to something at 11. And uh, if you could drop in the chat what your biggest takeaway is on your way out, I would, I would absolutely love it. I'm sorry that I did not stick to the time well. Mm. Well, Jasmine, you're at SFU, so um, if you like this, you know, come by, go to other workshops, um, come see us at the Student Learning Commons for one-on-one -on -one help. Yeah, the pattern that procrastinators follow unconsciously, yeah, and unconscious, like it often is unconscious, and it's a real um, good step to make the unconscious conscious so that you can tackle it. <laughs>
Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that everyone has the same struggles. I'm not alone. That's one of the purposes of Procrastination Awareness Week, you know, to bring students all together with their struggles. Yeah. A breakdown calculator. Yeah, Denise, you know, as a graduate student, Googling a dissertation calculator or a thesis calculator is good. I, at SFU, I'm pretty sure does not have one, but there are other institutions that do. Okay, oh, so I guess maybe people are waiting for that video in chat. Oh, not feeling guilty about putting your notifications off, like totally, totally disconnecting is a wonderful thing to do. Oh, people want to connect. Oh, that's great. More accountability. Yeah. So um, if you wanted to put your contact information in, I will, I'm going to just look for that video. I will stop the recording too. I, I kind of forgot to stop the recording and then I will look for the video. And um, oh God, I'm having trouble. Yeah, and I'll put the video link in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm so slow with Zoom. It's kind of, um, and I've got to look at how to stop the recording. Here we go. <clears throat>